Recording live from the Hoban Law Group here in Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Eric Singular. Welcome to the Hoban Minute. Today, Bob Hoban and myself are joined by the co-founder of The Last Prisoner Project and Harborside, Andrew D'Angelo. Andrew, thanks for being here with us this afternoon. Well, it's great to be with you and your listeners today. It's a uh, it's an exciting time as we we roll into the new year. Definitely a uh, long awaited journey to get to 2021 and it seems like everybody's got a pretty positive outlook on uh on how things are going to be moving forward. Definitely want to get your perspective. Uh, I believe you're located in California. Can you give us uh, a sense on your feeling for the year and how things are out in California? Sure, be happy to. Well, I, I too am optimistic for 2021. I'm, I'm actually much more optimistic for 2022 and beyond. Certainly, with respect to the cannabis industry, I think 21 is going to have some challenges. You know, getting out of COVID is going to be a challenge. Right wing extremism is clearly going to be a challenge. Um, whether or not, uh, w- w- you know, how how far up the Biden agenda cannabis is uh, remains to be seen. Um, Winning in Georgia was huge. Um, So I think that that, that, that's given my optimism a jolt today. Um, So, but, but, you know, it's, I think there's going to be some hard times this year too. And we're going to have some moments uh, that we're all looking at each other going, whoa, how are we going to get out of this? Um, So, but um, uh, Q3 and Q4 in particular, I'm really excited about once vaccinations are more, more widespread and we're moving towards, if not or achieved herd immunity and we can start gathering together again. I think that's going to be very important, in increasing people's confidence and, you know, just being in the world again. Now, you, you make some good points there and, and uh, we'll talk about Georgia here in just a moment, but. Uh, you know, sometimes we, we think about the new year and um, a lot of people seem to pretend that COVID's behind us just because we do have the vaccination. Of course, those things do, do change uh, rapidly um, and we'll have to stay the course on that. But that, of course, has inf- uh, in- interrupted a lot of what makes this cannabis industry so special. And that was a lot of the events that have taken place and, and build up over the years. Um, and you know, some of the, just the, the face to face creativity and interactions that have built this industry because of relationships and, uh, looking forward to getting those things back. But think about, let's talk about Georgia for a minute. Um, politics aside, let's talk about the specific policy issue as it relates to cannabis. Now we saw the Moore act, uh, and it did come out of the house. And of course our vice president or incoming vice president is a major sponsor of it. And also uh, happily to say it's a bipartisan bill uh, that that was produced and, and ultimately did come out of the House. And under the, uh, I guess we could say the current or the perhaps former iteration of our U.S. Senate, it wasn't going to come out of the Senate under any circumstance. But those times have changed. So, so let's talk a little bit about the Moore Act or just at least cannabis reform policy and how the reshaping of the Senate and the Democrats uh, controlling Congress uh, going forward, how that could advance changes in policy surrounding cannabis, because we've got to keep up with the rest of the world when our neighbors to the north and our neighbors to the south are going to lap us very soon. Oh, they are lapping us right now. Well, um, I think that um, the more act, gosh, I hope we get it. You know, th- that would be fantastic. The more act is by far the best piece of legislation that we've ever had uh, at the federal level. Uh, I think it may be we have to we have to keep 50 Democratic senators all voting yes, or at least however many Democrats we might lose in the Senate on that vote. We have to gain a, a, an equal number in the Republicans, and then we have to you know hold Biden and Harris to their promise to sign the legislation. Uh, so. So those could be harder mountains to climb than we think right now, but gosh, I hope not. I hope the more act gets through that, that would be tremendous uh, for, for our industry and 
it might be almost too much change too fast. <laughs> uh, we would we would go from one extreme to another, you know, very quickly. So, um, but I would love to see that happen. I think Safe Banking Act might happen before more acts. Uh, and I think Safe Banking Act happens now. I, I, I think that happens with, with the victory in Georgia. Look, Georgia has changed the entire thing for us at the federal level. Make no mistake about it. Even if we don't get the Moore Act, you know, sooner, right away, we'll get other things. Certainly we'll get, you know, the budgetary provisions preventing any enforcement against us. Certainly we'll get that. And certainly we may very well get banking, too. And maybe even, <laughs> dare I say it, 280E reform. Um, and it, it, even if we just got those things, even if we got 280E reform, instantly the, the industry goes from not very profitable to pretty darn profitable. And so I'm very excited about what's going to happen at the federal level as, uh, as a result of our victories in Georgia. And I did not predict that. I, I did not think the Democrats were going to win both those seats. So kudos to them. I'm, I'm so happy when I'm wrong about these things. Um, so, you know, it's a new day. It really is. No, it's, it's an excellent point. And, and as you alluded to earlier, um, let's see how far up the agenda or, or what the possibilities are of these cannabis reform measures. And we look at the Moore Act as, you know, that's the whole enchilada, so to speak. That That's a major change. It might be too much, too fast. But the banking reform under the Safe Banking Act 280, these are necessary things. But, you know, let's talk about the Moore Act for, for just a moment and how it segues in some of your other projects because um, ultimately the Moore Act, in my opinion, was a nice balance of creating uh, a criminal justice reform policy, uh, advancing the ball on potential commercial opportunities by its descheduling element, but also the social justice component. And social justice is, is something that's very important to us here, and we know it's very important to you. Um, and the Last Prisoner Project is one of those projects that ultimately does try to advance that. Sometimes as you look at this industry evolve and it's and it becomes about revenue and it becomes about commercial and, and regulated business, uh, those issues are left behind. We're doing our best state by state by state. Even in Colorado, we just finally enacted a social equity program for the first time um, on the heels of other states. California, one of the earlier movers and, and leaders in this space. Um, but talk a little bit about that social justice element and, and, and what the LPP does uh, to that end. Sure. Well, if I get any of these details wrong, please correct me. But my understanding of the MORE Act is, is the social justice provisions are quite aggressive. Number one, all, all records at the federal level, all cannabis conviction records, that there's pro they probably have to be nonviolent. They probably have to be, you know, no other charges other than cannabis. But they would immediately be expunged. Uh, immediately, retro, uh, retroactively, everybody, one stroke of the pen, done. So that is the kind of reform that LPP advocates for in the state houses at the state level. And, and we call that um, blanket reform or, or sometimes retroactive reform um, where, you know, we should be doing the same thing with releasing people from prison, not just expungement. Expungement, for those that don't know about it, is when you clear your criminal record. That's what expungement is. So it doesn't follow you around and prevent you from getting a job or getting an apartment or uh, a student loan or, or a bank loan or starting a business or any number of other things. It's very, very hard for people with criminal records to get any of those things. And it makes reentry really problematic and it makes recidivism very high. And and, and, and it creates basically a prison industrial complex that we have today. And the only way to interrupt that is, is to, is to reform. So, so I'm, I'm thrilled that the expungement provision is in there. We don't have, you know, get people out of prison release, prison release provisions in there in the same way. That's going to require a little bit more work. There are, there, there is some very good, social equity provisions in the MORE Act now um, um, with respect to giving grant money and, and licensing and priorities to, to social equity 
stakeholders. And so I, I'm thrilled that, that that's uh, in there as well. And, and, you know, we just always have to be vigilant when it comes to social justice and social equity and make sure that, one, we get promises made along those lines, and two, that the promises are kept. And, and sometimes the second part of that is even harder than the first. Yeah, it's, it, it seems really important to not slow down with the cannabis activism, even though we're seeing all of these positive developments, even though we're seeing so much progress, that that need for activism is still there. And something that we really uh, we really celebrate you you for, Andrew. And I, I wanted to bring up one other thing, um, because we are seeing this kind of shift in perception. And when I was looking at some of the projects that you were involved in, I saw uh, the D'Angelo Brothers Productions, and I, I was really interested um, by this line in there, creating new mythologies around cannabis. You know, we've for so long in the the content that's created around cannabis, the, you know, movies, films, music, we have the the stigma is kind of perpetuated by the lazy stoner, the Cheech and Chongs of the world. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but but when I read that line around new mythologies around cannabis, it really piqued my interest because it's something that we've talked a little bit about with other folks. But I, I want to get your take on on how do we do that and, and maybe some of the projects that you have cooking uh, to help us get there. Well, D'Angelo Brothers Productions is a production company my brother and I have together. It's our sort of our latest brotherhood project, I guess you could say. And when, you know, my Steve and I have always believed that interacting with the media, telling the stories of cannabis, being transparent about who we are, what we're about, why it matters in the world. Um, th- this is something we've we've done uh, over the decades, and um, my brothers highly skilled at this and and i've developed good skills in this and i went to acting school you know i went i I tried to be an actor so storytelling is just in our part of our dna at this point and it's very important because it's the only way that we can reduce stigma you know when we talk about winning the war of legalization we also have to talk about losing the battles of implementation certainly in california it's just been a disaster the frameworks and Still, you know, a huge, huge percentage of this state has local bans uh, for cannabis dispensaries and cannabis companies and, and the whole supply chain in many cases is banned, even though the people voted for uh, a legalization. We, we're seeing that all across uh, the country. So so uh, it, 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 we have to do a better job of, 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 of making sure that that we're executing right um, when it comes to implementing the, the, these things. Uh, so um, that, 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 that's one of the things that, that I try to talk a lot about. It's not just about winning the war of legalization. You're right. We can get complacent. And yes, we have to continue our activism. And, um, you know, when you, when you have a little momentum, that's when you really want to do your activism even more. And you want to put the pedal to the metal and, and, shovel some more coal into the fire and um let's get this let's let's build on the the momentum the creativity part of this and pushing stories out you know we're doing that you know jim belushi had his show growing belushi on the discovery channel that took sort of the reality tv cannabis genre to another another level we had um, murder mountain not too long ago which at least was um, a genre piece that, that people were familiar with that, that had a cannabis theme in it. Um, we've seen some great documentaries this year, one of which I was a part of called CBD Nation. Uh, and, um, you know, Ricky Lake had her documentary. And there's just been a lot of good content coming out now. And we need to create more and more and more of it, and hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of stories and all these different faces of cannabis because, Ultimately, our mission is to get cannabis into every medicine cabinet on Earth and into everybody's endocannabinoid system on Earth. That is the promise. That's the opportunity in front of us, and and that's we, that's why we're activists. It's not it's not because we really love being political activists. It's hard work and it sucks a lot. <laughs> um, 
it's not a great way to spend your life, you know, but it's necessary for us to be able to trade in cannabis and work with this plant and discover all the magic there in and try to do it in a good authentic way and, 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 and in a diverse way that, you know, make sure our industry doesn't make the same mistakes that a lot of the other industries made. And, and, and it's going to be hard for us to do that if, the politics and stigma of cannabis are still so hard. Um, if the supply chain can't be opened up because of bans and stigma, you know, we got to tell more stories so folks that live in those neighborhoods and those communities can start watching TV and all their streaming services and all their devices and they can see that this is good, not bad, and they can start changing their their opposition to us at the local level and, and, and soon it's going to be, please bring cannabis into my backyard instead of, you know, not in my backyard. Now you make some, you make some excellent points there. And I think that's counterintuitive about the California regulatory and legal environment that there are so many jurisdictions across the state that still have bans in place. And then even this sort of patchwork of laws over the last 10 plus years from, you know, effectively collectives under the medical program to, um, you know, businesses being operated under that program at the same time that there's state regulation. And there's just a lot of confusion. And as a result, the market hasn't worked that well. Uh, of course, Harborside is an exception to that rule in large part, or at least uh, it would uh, I would perceive it to be because of its success and, and its expansion. Uh, but, you know, how much of an effect in your opinion, does this, this historical, this traditional California cannabis market producing some of the highest quality marijuana and cannabis in the world, how much does that market influence the ability for the commercial market in California to succeed or even for the government to sort of take it seriously? Because that's at least my impression. I'm not saying that that's the case, but my impression is that these government agencies in California don't necessarily treat the commercial regulated marketplace like the the real business and, and the, 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 the corporate citizen that it really is. Well, I would agree with you. I, you know, I spent two years in Sacramento, three years really in Sacramento after Prop 64 passed trying to fix it. And we have one party rule here. The Democrats have one party rule here. Um, Gavin Newsom was a supporter of 64 and, you know, we thought we were going to be able to fix it and we have not been able to fix it despite one party rule, despite an industry that has tried and, you know, our, our political house isn't in very good order here in California. Unfortunately, our industry is very fragmented and, and, and we're not representing ourselves very well. We're not funding our, our reform efforts very well. And when we do, it's fragmented and it doesn't work. And, you know, our adversaries are very strong here. Law enforcement, League of City and Counties. Um, some of the environmental groups are not real happy with us because what's happened to some of the waterways with prohibition. Um, so but what the, what the political class doesn't understand is prohibition is, is, is the root cause of all these things, not, not legalization. And if we don't absorb that legacy market that's been operating in California for generations, if we don't absorb that, we're going to compete with it. And they're not going to stop doing cannabis. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? Lock them all up? Um, um, really? That's what we're going to do? Um, so th there is a real danger of Prohibition 2.0 happening, not just in California, but throughout the states that have legalized because of these bans and because of, you know, the corporate cannabis guys wanting to build moats around their businesses rather than opening up everything uh, to everybody. Um, and that's the kind of behavior we have to call out. There's plenty of room for everybody, the craft people, the legacy people, the big corporate guys the CBD guys, the open field hemp, all of that, it, there's plenty of room for everybody. You know, our biggest challenge is making sure we don't, you know, cut down forests to, to create more farmland for hemp. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's not going to be, oh, we don't, it, 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 the opportunity is so big, the market is so big. 
these moat building exercises that all these people are going through are really, really silly and stupid. Um, so I, 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 that's the kind of thing we have to open the market. It doesn't make any sense. I think the biggest reform that we could all be advocating for and we, we, is the interstate, interstate compact that Adam Smith and, and, and some of those folks in Oregon are working on. Uh, Oregon already passed the interstate compact law. We, we tried to get one done in Sacramento. It didn't happen. Uh, but all you need is three states and their legislatures to agree for an interstate compact, and we can start selling weed to each other and, and shipping it to each other and, and make the Fed stop us. Um, and they will not. Okay, they will not if the states have a compact. Um, so that that piece of reform could really again open up the supply chain and get some of those California and Oregon uh, legacy people in into the supply chain, and we could create efficiencies where the corporate guys could buy it all and sell it and make a nice profit too, you know, and and just have a little bit more decentralized uh, supply chain. Mm-hmm. No, that's that's a that's an excellent perspective, and, and it's you know it's something that again, um, it's a it's a it's not specifically exclusive to California, but it is it is something that's that's more prevalent in California because of its rich history there, and you know we're starting to see that. I'm working in Mexico quite a bit and, and working with their legislature and, and several mm, potential great, operators cool. there, and you know that's a whole nother animal. What do you think about that? I mean, you think about taking a market that's largely been controlled. Uh, by you know uh, the illicit uh, narco trade, if you will, which of course uh, was born in large part because of our you know drug policies from the United States over so many decades that that really created this monster. How do you put a commercial market in place against the backdrop of this historical uh, you know? I hate to use the word criminal activity, but that's what it's been treated like, and that's frankly how uh, those those operators have reacted. Well, I'm super excited about Mexico. I think it's amazing. It is complicated because of the cartels. It's really hard for us as Americans to fully understand the impact of the drug war when they've had 50, 60,000 people dead, you know, from this. And I think that's, you know, probably on a yearly basis, not a total basis. So um, uh, they've had extremely extreme suffering. Uh, and, uh, and this is an effort to I don't think the cartels are actually going to think the legalization is that big a threat because they've diversified themselves quite <laughs> well. Um, but, uh, but more importantly, it, it's going to, uh, there's, I hope the indigenous provisions are kept in the law to give indigenous folks a, 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 an advantage in licensing and, and, and in production. I hope that, um, we can, uh, create different models in Mexico that are, that include small, medium, and larger uh, companies, and I hope things like um, nimbyism and um, you know the lack of being able to get things like consumption and um, hospitality and things like that that we've struggled with here. I hope that could, I, I'm hopeful that that will happen faster, actually, because the hospitality industry in Mexico is so. It's such an important industry. Why not integrate weed into it now that it's federally legal? Um, so I'm, I'm super excited about Mexico. I hope to do a ton of work down there uh, and help help build that industry and carry some of the terrible, painful lessons that we've all learned here uh, there so they don't make the same mistakes, you know. It would be nice if we could avoid that. Yeah. Those are really, really excellent points. And yeah, it just kind of makes you think about <clears throat> the challenges in creating a unified voice for, for certain places. I think about uh, here in Colorado, why we had more success, uh, and maybe you wouldn't even call it that, but why the transition over to a recreational market went more smoothly than in California. But you know, you, you put it against the backdrop of that historical cultivation well, and also we're we're one tenth of the size of, of that state by way of population. Well, yeah, you had better public policy. I mean, at the end of the day, your public policy and framework was better, uh, and and it it helped a lot. So, and yes, it, California is always going to be complicated. Um, you know, Oregon managed a lot better. They had some very 
bad problems with overproduction in the beginning. Um, but that's starting starting to sell, sort itself out, and they're not having this problem with the legacy market and the and the regular market. A lot of the legacy people pivoted over to hemp, and you know the the, the regulators there worked very hard to get people in to some kind of legal um, license um, uh, entity. They 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 so you know, and then you know, look at Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Wow, they, they, they did a tremendous job with, um, uh, and, you know, there's going to need to be some consolidation in Oklahoma, no doubt. Um, but they didn't, they don't, in Oklahoma, the locals can't ban. Can't ban it. Guess what? You're, you have to have it. And so the supply, supply chain is much more efficient. Well, it's interesting to see how each state and each region approaches this thing differently, but it's exciting to be part of it as a whole. And I do agree with you that, that 2021 is going to be a very good year for cannabis. The, perhaps the first half of it is, is, is sort of on the, on the heels of the UN changes and, and some of the things we're seeing uh, change and some of the Democrat policies that we think will come out of Washington, D.C. And that commercial activity, uh, while it's sort of lining up and gearing up, uh, that it really will uh, really reach its stride by that third, fourth quarter of the year. Um, and then things are starting to move forward. Remember, this industry, at least from a commercial perspective, was born during a recession, at least in many states around the country. Yes. Um, oh, yes. You're, yes, you're so right. Oh, you're so right about this. Yeah, I know exactly what you're going to say continue but you're, no, you're still right no so so born during a recession so if there's an economic downturn you know why is it that the united states lacks uh, is so far behind and yes we've got our problems and we've got a political divide so far uh so deep that you really can't see the other side of it but at the end of the day it's a situation where other countries around the world in droves over the last six to nine months alone have said, let's use cannabis as an economic driver, as a driver towards criminal justice reform, as a, as a driver for a new economy, a plant-based economy. And we're seeing those things happen. So I don't think, as you point out, uh, that, that we're going to see, even if there is a even deeper economic downturn because of COVID, it doesn't seem to have an effect on this industry. It doesn't mean it's recession proof necessarily, although the products might be, because it's not truly an industry yet until, to your point earlier, we can have interstate commerce and we can have a baseline foundation of what the industry needs to be in the United States. But with that said, being an economic driver, it's, it's going to keep moving forward. But as we point out, it's, it was born in a recession. It was born in the green rush started because uh, in large part, the economy for developers and other entrepreneurs it just wasn't there. They, they weren't investing in other things. There weren't necessarily other economic opportunities. And, and this is where it was born from. And this is still the beginning. You've been working in this industry for a long, long time. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it feels old or older to people like yourself and, and people that have worked in the industry for a long time. But at the end of the, end of the day, it's still the, really early in the game. And that's the thing that people need to recognize, which makes it fraught with opportunity for an economic downturn that we're going to continue to see for at least a while. Yes, you're so right. I mean, I think that the economic downturn that's going to be caused by what we're going through with the pandemic might be, you know, deeper and, and, and more problematic than the, you know, mortgage crisis downturn of 08, 09, simply because the, the mortgage crisis, if you're underwater on your house, that sucked. And, but if you weren't, it didn't. Whereas the pandemic has affected the behavior of every single person uh, in the country. It's affected where a lot of people live. It's affected how we work. It's affected um, where we work. Um, and all of that's going to have a ripple effect. And, you know, what's going to happen to cities? Are they going to snap right back? Or are people going to be like, eh, not so sure. Um, you know, are, are, are suburbs going to now and, and more you know, smaller, mid-sized towns that have good internet connections and lower cost of living all of a sudden experience booms. Um, so, so I think there may be 
cycles and places that are very depressed and other tr- places that uh, are, are more robust and, and it's, and cannabis can help even all of that out, you know? Uh, so I think we may actually see as we did in the last recession, like you said, a lot more people embracing um, cannabis in their towns and, and, you know, we're, we're seeing it in California. We're, we, we're, we're, we, I don't know. It was only about 40 municipalities that had either a tax or an ordinance to, to license on the ballot this past November. So we still have, I don't know, 500 to go, but, but we got, you know, 10% of them, um, or so. Um, and, and, and next November, there'll be more. Uh, and, and, you know, the way it works in California, you, the voters have to, vote on any tax increase, even a brand new tax. The voter of that town or that county or the statewide, if it's statewide, has to vote on it and it has to pass. So um, um, so you'll start to see more and more of the, and then they'll eventually get licensed, you know, and, and by 2022, 2023, all of a sudden retail in California is doubled from where it is now. I think you'll see that in Michigan. You'll see that in uh Massachusetts. Um, you'll see that in lots of places, um, places like Boston, you know, Boston's a nightmare uh, because the mayor there is against us. So for a long time, he, he kept the licensing from happening. And then he got, he couldn't win those battles anymore. And now he's preventing zoning from happening. Yeah. So you got these places in Boston ready to open. They've been ready to open for months and months and months, if not years, and they can't get the zoning. Um, uh, because of the mayor there. Well, when that mayor is in so much red deficit because no one wants to live in Boston anymore because it's too costly to live there and they can live up in Chelsea or Revere um, for, a, you know, 30% less and telecommute, guess what's going to happen? All of a sudden, Boston's going to embrace cannabis and you're going to have dispensaries getting le- licensed left and right there. Um, and, and so I think we're going to see that pattern over and over again. It's exactly the same thing that happened in the last downturn. Um, when people are desperate for jobs and economic activity, they all of a sudden their problems and their fears relating to cannabis go away. And um, <laughs> everyone's attitude changes quite a bit. Uh, so I think you're right. I think I, and that's why I'm bullish, you know. Uh, uh, especially 2022 and 2023. I mean, these are the biggest years for cannabis in the history of humankind are going to be 2022, 2023, uh, even 2021 to a certain degree. But, but, but 2022 and 2023, when all this new retail is online, all that the supply chain has been built behind it, and you start to have consumption lounges and bars and and integration, consumption and hospitality integration into by 22 and 23 into in places like California and maybe Massachusetts, Colorado, certainly. Um, it's going to be a whole new day, a whole new day. And I'm very, very bullish. We, we could be, you know, multiple total size of where we are now. This is absolutely the time to embrace cannabis. And Andrew, we thank you for everything you've done to steward this cannabis plant. And we know that you will continue to fight the good fight. We thank you so much for your time here with us on the Hoban Minute today, my friend. Well, it's great being with uh, the Hoban Minute and thank you all for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hoban Minute. Do you have any ideas for episode topics or guests? We would like to hear from you. Reach out to us at media at Hoban.law and stay tuned for more on the Hoban Minute.